The other day, I saw a Facebook post of a new angler holding up the first ever trout that he caught on a fly rod. He was super excited. He's grinning ear to ear, as he should be. And then I made the mistake of looking at the comments. Well, that's a nice dead fish you got there. Man, you're squeezing the life out of it. Why are you fishing if you don't know how to treat fish? Man, those comments were vicious. And unfortunately, I'm sure we've all seen something similar. The truth though, is that if you're a brand new angler, you really might not know the best catch and release tactics and techniques. And guess what? That's completely fine, especially if you're self-taught because you're new to the sport. We can't expect you to know everything on your first day on the water. That's just not fair to anybody, but most of all to the beginners. And the only thing those Facebook comments do is upset everybody and just add to the general nastiness that is the online world. They're not helping anything. So on today's episode of Untangled, you are going to learn all about the best catch and release tactics, as well as some tips for getting fish in the net quicker and more effectively. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant, behind the microphone for the 65th time. I honestly cannot believe we've made it this long without me getting extradited to Botswana for that incident on the island of Spice all those years ago. But, well, we won't talk about that here. <laughs> Instead, what we are going to talk about, in addition to our usual buffalo wing and Diet Coke banter, is catching and releasing trout. We've got a lot to dig into today, and this is a topic that generates a lot of opinion one way or the other. Uh, it, it's really interesting to me that it generates that much opinion because, in my opinion, <laughs> if you'll forgive the pun there, there really isn't room for a whole lot of opinion here because there is. Th this is one of the few instances in fly fishing where there is an absolute right and wrong way to do something. And it's very rare that you run into that where there is an absolute right and wrong way to do something in this sport. That's one of the beauties of it is there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do this and in, enjoy this sport. But when it comes to catching and releasing trout, uh, trout especially, but all fish in general, there are some guidelines that it's important for everybody to know. And the beginners especially, especially if you're a self-taught angler, I don't know, we've certainly done a better job in recent years, and by we, I mean the fly fishing community as a whole, but I still don't think the fly fishing community as a whole does a spectacular job of communicating catch and release and best uh, best practices for handling trout in a way that doesn't come off as really kind of preachy, because, I, I mean, y y you get those really nasty Facebook comments uh, like, oh, well, you're killing that fish, or oh, why, how, I can't believe you hold that fish out of the air. You're, you're a fish murderer. You shouldn't even be fishing. Like, uh, that doesn't do anything to help the concept of catch and release at all. All it does is upset people and really kind of turns them off to the whole idea of it. But if you get into this and you decide that you are going to catch and release most of your fish, which most of us do. And if you decide to keep some for the dinner plate, more power to you. If your local regulations allow it and there's enough fish in the stream to support harvest, go for it. They're tasty. I, <laughs> I, I managed to survive for a good chunk of my early 20s on trout. Uh, and I think there's more than a few people who've been there. <laughs> so it, it, there's nothing wrong with keeping a few fish. But if we're going to catch and release trout, it stands to reason that we want to do it in a way that's as good for them as possible so that those fish live to swim another day and either we get to catch them again or they get to grow bigger and we catch them when they're 29 inches instead of 20 and everybody else has the opportunity to catch that fish. Uh, that's, that's really the genesis behind practicing good catch and release practices is making sure that we are leaving the resource in as good a shape as we possibly can and that is what we're going to focus on in this episode are those best practices. And I do want to point out before we get into the weeds here too much, everything that I'm discussing, everything that we are talking about in this episode 
This is not just me making stuff up. This isn't just, well, Durant thinks it should be this way, so daggum, this is how we're going to do it. No, this stuff's actually backed up by science. And I hate ever saying, like, there's a scientific consensus on anything because inherently science is always changing. Science is always evolving. It's always adapting to new information. But the information that I'm going to share with you today is backed up by our current understanding. It's changing and evolving. But this is what currently we can say based on observation, scientific observation, is the best way to catch and release fish. And we really have, I, I've got to tip my cap to the folks over at Keep Fish Wet. They are the leaders in this. Uh, they've done tons and tons of research in recent years into the best practices to use while catching or releasing fish, especially trout on fly rods. So again, this isn't just me coming up with something and trying to shove it all at you. This is one of the rare places where the fly fishing industry as a whole agrees that this is what we need to do. So what exactly do we need to do? What are the best practices? What it, we, we catch and release fish, what's the best way to do it? Well, the short of it is this. The less time that you spend fighting fish, the better off that fish is going to be when you release it back into the water. And I know that's a little counterintuitive because we love to fight the fish. That's part of the thrill of going out there, especially when you hook into a big one and your heart gets pounding, you see it, it gets really big and you're like, you're really excited. This just happened to me. Me and Alex got out last weekend. There was a break in the weather up here and we got out and we were just having a, really kind of an average day. I wouldn't even say it was a very good day. Alex had hooked a really, really beautiful cutthroat and lost it. And then he landed a beautiful brown, and I was skunked still. And then I finally hooked into a decent fish, and I saw it jump, and I was like, oh, my gosh. I, I had that moment, like that heart-sopping moment when you're like, that's a big fish. And that fight took a long time because it was a big, it really, it was a really big rainbow. And I'm not saying that to toot my own horn or anything. I, that came out a lot more arrogant than I meant it to sound. I got lucky and caught a big fish. It, it was a, it was a good time, but that fight took a longer time and we enjoy the fight. We really do because you're, you're battling the fish. You're trying to outwit it, but I was painfully aware of how long it was taking and I was doing my best to get it in the net as quickly as possible. I cranked my drag down. I was using side pressure to fight the fish and we're actually going to get into that here in a bit uh, later on in, in this segment about how to uh, fight fish effectively. We'll get we'll get there in a minute. But anyways, I got this fish in. It was probably, I, I don't know, I'm terrible at estimating time. I want to say four or five minutes that I spent fighting it. it. It's probably less in reality. Excuse me. But that's probably a long fight in, in the grand scheme of things. That's, that's a long fight. Usually you want to get those fish in the net as quickly as you possibly can. Sometimes it's not possible but you want to do your best to get them in. Uh, because if you fight them, if you fight fish, especially trout to pure exhaustion, that trout actually has a higher chance of experiencing some sort of post-catch distress. Uh, that post-catch distress can range from anything like not being able to effectively avoid predators to actually dying as a result of a fight that goes on too long. I I actually had this happen to me years ago. I was still in high school. I think it was right after I got my driver's license. Uh, I borrowed my dad's truck. Uh, I don't think he knew that I was gone. <laughs> he called me. I was. I drove down to this mountain that was like three and a half, four hours away from home. And he called me. I think it was two hours into the drive. He's, where's my truck? Well, I'm in it. Well, you need to get home. Well, uh, I can't. I'm going camping. Well, what the heck you are going camping? You got to get home. And, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, dad. I'm losing you. But you're, I'm go, you're going through a tunnel, dad. And, boom. You know, uh, it was, it was kind of awful. But anyways, I get to, I get to this lake and I hooked into a pretty nice tiger trout. And I fought that thing for I don't know how long. Now, I was very inexperienced at this age. I, I didn't know too much. Uh, and I fought that thing and fought that thing. 
And I don't know why. I just, I had the drag set really light. And I was like, oh, I'm going to fight it. And it's going to be epic. And I'm going to be so cool. And by the time I got it in, that fish was, that fish was almost dead. It was so exhausted. And I netted it. I took a picture of it. And I was going to put it back in the water. And I put it back in. And he went belly up within a two or three seconds of going back in the water. And he never swam off. I fought him to exhaustion. He died right there. And I felt really bad about it. I, I did. And that's kind of stuck with me ever since. That is an extreme example, though. Uh, I, I don't think most of us are going to be as objectively uh, abusive of a resource the way that I was as a kid. But I also didn't know much better either at the time. So if you get into a situation where a fish doesn't swim off or does die and you're, you're still new to this stuff, or if you've been in that situation before, don't beat yourself up over it because if you didn't know any better, you didn't know any better, right? That's the whole goal of untangled and VFC really in general is educate anglers to help make you the best angler you can possibly be. So anyways, I, I, that happened. It was not very good, but that should be your number one goal. The number one thing you can do for good catch and release is get that fish in the net as quickly as possible. And there is one more quote on this point uh, that I want to share. It's from one of the scientists over at Keep Fish Wet, uh, Sasha Clark Danilchuk, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing the last name right, Sasha. Uh, it really drives home this point that I want to make. Uh, the quote is, Sometimes the fish we catch uh, and release get injured or die. There is no getting around the fact, and there is only so much that is in an angler's control. However, by better understanding the processes that can lead to negative outcomes for fish, we anglers can adjust what is in our control to ensure that more fish live to be caught another day. And that really is the, uh, the thing that I want you guys to take away from this. Uh, is that we need to do everything in our control to treat the fish as best we can. So we've talked about, well, minimize fight time. How do we do that? And what's the best way to handle that trout once we get it in the net? Well, let's spend the rest of the segment here talking about that. I've got three tips. Uh, hold, yes, three tips. I <laughs> had, to, had to make sure. Sometimes I... Sometimes I add an extra tip and forgot that I did, but there are three tips here that uh, will help you put fish in the net more quickly, and that will help you uh, obviously prolong the, the life of that fish as much as you can. So tip number one, you want to keep tension on the line. This is one of the biggest mistakes that I see anglers make, especially beginners, and it costs them fish. It costs me fish a lot too. In fact, that trip I was on with Alex last Saturday, uh, just as a matter of fact, we I, I hooked into one fish right at the right right before we were about to leave. I hooked into this fish, and I didn't have very much tension on the line, and then it swam straight at me. Now there's not a whole lot you can do when the fish swims directly at you because they're doing that to pop the hook free. They know they're educated, they're smart, they've got a PhD and pissing people off. And <laughs> Uh, but if I'd had a little bit more tension on the line when I hooked it, I might have been able to land him. So it, it still happens, uh, even if you've been fishing for a while, as I've been lucky to do. Uh, but uh, if you don't keep tension on your line throughout the fight, it is that much easier for your fly to pop out of the trout's mouth. If you watched our most recent video we did on winter fishing, we got these uh, this little video series on YouTube. We've got to come up with a better name for it, but it's basically a glimpse into how we fish. It's how I fish, how Alex fishes, and we narrate it with, we put GoPros on so you can see it, and we walk you through how we do that. I'll put a link to that in the podcast description in case you want to watch that one. But we did one on winter fly fishing, and you will actually see me lose a fish because I didn't keep enough tension on the line when it came up higher in the water column during the fight. And... If you're watching the video podcast, you'll see that clip or you will have just seen that clip pop up. So make it a point to keep tension on the line throughout the fight and you will avoid one of the most common mistakes people make that cause them to lose fish and 
that can tire that fish out unnecessarily. More tension on the line means you've got more power over the fish, which means you can get it in the net quicker. Which brings us to the second tip, which is use your reel. We just did an entire episode of Untangled about reels. So if you're new to fly fishing and you need to learn or you need to know some more about reels, please go check that out. I've got that linked in the show notes for you as well. But remember this very basic concept. Fly reels are built to help you land fish more quickly. That is their job. They're fancy line holders. That's kind of what I joke about them for. But when you get a nice fish on there, they are indispensable in landing those bigger fish quickly. So uh, if the fish is starting to run on you, or let's say you've hooked up and the fish runs, or it just kind of digs down a bulldogs down to the bottom of the river, then you can really uh, reel in that slack line pretty quick and put that fish on the reel immediately. And that will help you land that fish a lot quicker because then you can crank that drag down. They can't pull off as much line. You've got a lot more control over that fish. Uh, and and it, it really it really doesn't even matter how big that fish is either at the end of the day because they can use the current to their advantage as well. I was out a couple of weeks ago fishing here in Wyoming and I caught a, it was like a 12 inch brown. It wasn't very big, but it was during a blue wing hatch. It came up, it ate the, ate the blue wing right off the top and then scampers off into the main crush of the current. And I was fighting the fish plus the current. So I really had to crank the drag down and it used the drag on the reel to get that fish back into me. So make sure you're using your reel. And then tip number three, uh, and this is <laughs> one of my favorite tips to share, your rod angle matters. I used to make fun of the anglers who would bend their rods to the side when fighting trout because they looked like samurais or Jedi out there, like, choo, 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 like, you know, flipping everything from side to side. Uh I just thought it looked ridiculous. I thought it was overkill. I didn't think it made any difference. However, I learned that I was completely wrong. These anglers, those anglers that I made fun of, knew what was up because when you bend your rod to the side, you are able to apply side pressure and you are using the thick butt section of the rod that's got more power to fight the fish. If you just keep your tip up straight through the whole fight, and try to move the fish just by moving the tip of your rod, you're only utilizing the power in the tip section, which is the weakest part of the rod. That's the way it's designed. But if you turn your rod to the side and you use side pressure, you are utilizing the entire length of the rod, plus that beefy butt section and the midsection as well, to put more pressure on the fish and guide them back to the net. Now, we do hear that reminder all the time that you've got to keep your rod tip high, but that's really just a reminder to keep tension on the line more than it is a tip to actually help you fight fish. So when you turn your rod to the side, remember you access a stronger butt section of the rod um, and you will be able to more effectively turn and move fish. There's a couple of examples of what this side pressure looks like in that winter video that we just did that I talked about. And I'll have Alex put a clip uh, of that here into the video podcast for those of you watching on YouTube so you can see what I'm talking about. Just keep that side pressure on. You will be in business. And we also just released a one of our masterclass videos on how to fight and land fish. So I'll link that in the podcast description as well so you can go take a look at that because we've got an entire, I think it's like 13 minutes. It's a pretty lengthy video that shows you the best way to land fish quickly. So those are your three tips to get fish in quickly. But what happens after you put that fish in the net? What are the best practices there? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to handle the fish? Well, again, these are science-backed principles. This isn't just me pulling something out and saying, here, everybody, do this. This is science-backed stuff. The most important thing you can do is keep that fish wet. Trout have a slime layer, and I'm sure you felt it if you've touched a trout, they're very slimy. That slime layer actually protects them from disease. And you want to make sure that when you go to touch a fish, get your hands wet first, because then when you go to touch the fish, 
you're going to remove less of that slime layer than you would if you go in with dry hands. Dry hands will just rip that slime layer right off, and it actually leaves fish very vulnerable to uh, disease and to, to injury. The other reason that you want to keep that fish wet is the very simple fact that fish need water to breathe, right? The, the water goes in their mouth, it goes over their gills, and their gills separate the oxygen out of the water. That's how they breathe. And so if they're not in the water, they're not breathing. And if they're not breathing, well, then they're kind of dying because that's what happens to us if we don't breathe, right? We need it. The fish need it. Keep them wet as much as you possibly can. You also want to minimize the air exposure for that very same reason I just talked about. They need to breathe. If they're out in the air, they're not going to be able to breathe too well. Now, that leads us to this whole uh, topic of, well, I've caught a fish. I want to take a picture of it. Well, what's the best way to do that? Personally, I'm a fan of the pictures where you lift the fish just barely out of the water so that it's like half in and half out of the water. You snap that picture. I think those pictures look better than the standard grip and grin. That's just my two cents. You might not feel that way, and that's fine. But that's that's how I take a lot of my fish pictures. I try and keep them mostly in the water and and keep especially keep their heads in the water. That, that's what I aim for. Uh, excuse me. But if you do decide to lift the fish up out of the water, try and do that for five seconds max. Just lift it up, get a picture, put it back down. Real simple, real easy. You're minimizing that air exposure, and that should always be a goal. Uh, one more thing that you can do is make sure that you use a rubber net. The slime layer that I mentioned earlier, uh, cloth nets will rip that slime layer away. The rubber nets don't. They're much more gentle on the fish. So make sure that you use a rubber net. And last but not least, when you are holding the fish, do not squeeze them to death. It's really easy to want to because they squirm away from you. Uh, and I, I made this point in our in our masterclass video about fighting fish. But it, the more you squeeze them, I've found, the more they squirm. And it's like squeezing a bar of soap, uh, bar of soap, a bar of soap in the shower where you squeeze it. It's just going to keep flying out of your hands, getting everywhere, right? I just... I gently pick them up. I use gentle pressure. I'm as soft as I possibly can be. And instead of squeezing the fish to hold it for a picture, I like to just lift. I put one hand underneath their pectoral fins. Those are the fins that are closest to their mouth. It's like on a human. You know, we've got our pecs. I'm flexing mine here for the video podcast. You guys are treated to this absolute specimen of a man here. And that was a joke for those of you in Rio Linda. Uh, <laughs> but I like to just support them. I just hold up underneath their pectoral fins. And then if it's big, I'll, I'll hold around the tail. But if not, I'll just kind of hold the tail up. Uh, that's the best way I like to do it. If I'm, if I'm taking a picture, you don't squeeze them. And throughout the handling process, don't squeeze them either. That's why we recommend using forceps to get hooks out and why I recommend using barbless hooks anyways because those barbless hooks pop out much quicker so it reduces your handling time with the fish. And that really is the last thing uh, to remember here is the less you handle the fish, the better. Because at the end of the day, they're wild creatures. And the more that you handle them, the higher their stress level is going to go. And then they're going to carry that stress with them once they're released and swimming off into the water. So that that covers it. That's your crash course in catch and release uh, best practices and ethics. Uh, again, this is all science-backed stuff, and I hope this is informative and doesn't come across as me on a high horse, like preaching to the unwashed masses who don't know how to handle a fish, because that's that's not where I'm coming at this from at all. Uh, I wish I'd had this talk when I started fly fishing, because I know I would have killed a lot fewer fish, because I, I, when I was getting ready for this show this week, I was thinking about, man, I have killed so many fish. <laughs> Because I just I just didn't know any better. And, and again, like I said at the very beginning of the show, the fly fishing industry doesn't do the best job of teaching you how to handle fish. And the we don't do the best job of teaching catch and release. We're doing a lot better than we used to. There's a lot of room to improve. And that's why I wanted to do this episode because it is really important. And I wanted to make sure we got this information out to the rest of you. But 
enough on that. We've got a bunch more of the show to get to. We've got your questions to get to. I will answer them. Really interesting questions from listeners, including how to tie better knots, some tips for tying flies, the fly that keeps me up at night, and fishing weird water. All that is coming up next, so stay tuned. Micah from Utah starts his off this week with a question. He says, hey, Spencer, this is one of the most embarrassing things to admit, but I've never had wings after going fly fishing. Going to make that a priority now. Well, dadgummit, Micah, you better. How can you listen to this show and not go have wings after fishing? I mean, I just, I don't, I, I don't even want to read the rest of this question now. No, I'm kidding. Of course, I'm going to read the rest of your question. <laughs> All right, back to Micah's question. He says, second embarrassing thing to admit, I've been losing lots of fish lately due to my knots failing. I've watched tutorials, practice tying the knots, and test each knot on each fly before I cast. But when I set the hook, about a second later, my line comes back with a little crinkled end from where my knot came undone, and the fish is swimming off with my fly, probably laughing at me. Any tips for getting my knots to hold better so I can put some more fish to the net? By the way, they don't seem to have any problems holding when the line gets tangled. Thanks for the work y'all do. I'm a huge VFC fan. Live real life. Well, Mike, I really do appreciate that uh, a whole bunch. And since you're from Utah, uh, go hit up wingers. They've actually got pretty good wings. I I had the chance to go to uh, Buffalo and Niagara last year. First time I'd ever been to that part of the East Coast. And Well, it's not even the East Coast. Uh, first time I've been back east. Or, no, first time I've been to that part of the east. There we go. <laughs> That's what I was trying to get out. And I got to go to the OG Anchor Bar where Buffalo Wings were invented. And it was a transcendental experience. And I'm not the same man now. It changed my life forever. And I'll probably do a whole podcast about that at some point. But point being, the wingers' wings are pretty good for what they are. If you get them naked with the classic Buffalo sauce, they're, they're pretty good. The, the sauce is nothing to complain about. They do, they do a pretty solid job. Uh, they don't quite compare to Rocky Mountain Wing Shack, which uh, is my favorite wing joint in Utah. Uh, but but they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty stinking good at wingers. So uh, anyways, to your question about knots, what do we do? Well, you're right. That little crinkly end means that the knot is coming undone. So what that means to me, if you're using the clinch knot, it means that you are not going around the line enough times. So what you do with a clinch knot is you take your your tippet or your leader and you push it through the eye of the hook and then you wrap the line around uh, itself. I do at least seven times. This is uh, something my buddy Chad taught me Uh, a long time ago. We were fishing uh, in one of Utah's secret spots and I kept losing fish the same way. And Chad's like, let me look at your knots. And so I showed him and I'd done like two turns on my clinch knot and then put it back through the, uh, through the loop and everything just kept pulling, pulling free. So that's my number one recommendation is add more turns to that. I always go to seven. I sit there and I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I push it through. And then the other thing I do, and this might be happening to you as well, Micah, is I hold the tag end uh, tight, and then I pull everything else with my other hand. So I, I push the tag end through on that clinch knot, and then I pull my leader or tip it tight. Um, I'll usually uh, stick it in my mouth, lick it real quick so it seats well. And then uh, something as well, if you if you trim it too close, I've had knots come undone because I trimmed that tag super close. I want it as perfect as possible. Just try and get pretty close. You don't have to be super close. Um, Without seeing your knots in person, that is, uh, that's about as much as uh, advice or uh, info as I can give you. Just make sure you're going around at least seven times on the clinch knot. Uh, Seat them well, and then don't trim the tag ends too close. Otherwise, you might, and uh, you might run the risk of losing fish in the way that you did. But I do appreciate that you were brave enough to share that because I know there's other anglers out there who have that same question. So we really do appreciate it, Micah. Thank you so much. 
Jay from California is up next with his question. He writes in and says, Spencer, I love your show. You managed to go deep on so many topics, but in a relatable way that really helps. I also love your Ron Swanson-esque delivery and humor. If I had a drink of Coke, it would probably be a regular Coke with a Bouye bourbon. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, I enjoyed your 13 fly tying tips, and I wanted to share that what helped me start tying was to start with saltwater ties, since they are generally so much larger and less complicated. Now, on to his questions. And first, before I get to his actual question, Jay, thank you for the tip. I love that. If anybody else has tips that they want to share with the Untangled audience, please send them on in. I love getting tips from y'all. It, it It's wonderful to hear because... I, I mean, I, I have my experience from fishing. I do a lot of research for the show every week. Uh, but the more tips we can get, the more info we can dump into this thing, man, the better it's going to be. So thank you for sending that in. Now, his two questions. Uh, number one, what is your favorite fly to tie? And two, what tie keeps you up at night? Or what is your trickiest tie? Thanks for an awesome podcast and tight lines. Well, Jay, thank you uh, I, I would not ever consider myself Ron Swanson-esque. I can't even grow a mustache as good as Ron's. Unfortunately, it's something I'm working on, but, you know, there's only so much. Uh, genetics plays a role, and I keep seeing all those ads on Instagram for grow your beard like a man or beard growth 101, and I'm, I've almost bought it. I hate to admit this. I hate to admit this, but I've almost bought a couple of those. Uh because I'm like, yeah, you know, my beard could be sicker in places. Yeah, I could, I could make it look better. I feel like Kip from Napoleon Dynamite, right? Uh, <laughs> I just, oh, anyways, point is, I appreciate being com- uh, compared to Ron Swanson, but I'm not sure if I'm in that, uh, um, if I'm in that stratosphere yet. Now, I really do like your uh, idea, Jay, of tying, of starting with saltwater flies. That's a very good way to start because they are bigger and they're generally a little simpler, especially the clouds or minnow. That's a very simple fly. And you can use that in freshwater too. But that whole idea of starting simple and then building up to complex patterns is exactly what Alex did when he put together our beginning fly tying masterclass. Uh, You start with a San Juan worm and then you move on to the zebra midge and then the hare's ear and then you move on to other flies after that. So it's a progressive experience that gets easier the more that you do it. And if you actually haven't checked out our beginner fly tying masterclass, please do. I'll, I'll leave a link in the show notes so you can check it out. Alex did a phenomenal job putting that thing together. It's very impressive. Now, as for the fly that keeps me up at night, y'all might laugh at this, but I don't think I have ever tied an elk or caddis that I actually like. I always mess up the wing somehow always and it drives me absolutely nuts because i can tie other flies that use deer or elk hair just fine like sparkle duns i I can tie with the i use uh elk hair on my sparkle duns it's not a big deal but i struggle with the elk hair caddis for some reason i don't know why at at this point i think it's like a mental thing it was like shack with his free throws right he could never get it and it was all a mental block i just oh it's so frustrating so I, I just struggle with the elk carcatus, and I don't know why. Um, I also struggle with some of the various emerger patterns that I tie for mayflies because those can be really tricky, and then I always doubt whether they're good enough to catch fish. Um, and that's probably why I fall back on the sparkle done so much because I catch fish on the sparkle done, and it's a wonderful emerger. I love it. It's probably like next to the zebra midge, the sparkle done. It's probably my favorite, not even probably, it it is my favorite fly. I love that thing. So uh, anyways, thank you, Jay, for the questions and for the tip that you shared with the VFC audience. It was wonderful. Dylan from Arizona writes in and says, hello, Spencer. This is my second question I've asked to the show because I am flat out addicted. I look forward every week to the show coming out. Here's my question. I live in the Phoenix area and the closest trout river to Phoenix is the Salt River. Other than that, you have to drive over an hour and a half away to two hours just to get to trout water. The problem I have is that the Salt River, uh, it is a very weird river compared to the ones we see on the YouTube videos we all watch. It is nothing like the famous rivers up in Wyoming and Montana. What I mean by it being an odd river 
is that this river is constructed of small riffles into large pools and almost no long runs in the entire river. But each of these pools are kind of like a mini pond each. They are large and almost still water depending on how much they crank up the flows. It's difficult to find trout in this river. Do you have any tips on fishing these weird rivers that are not normal to anything you would normally see? And to finish off, I wish you were my ELA teacher. My ELA teacher doesn't fly fish, and you seem like a great teacher. Thanks so much, Tight Lines. Uh, well, Dylan, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you a, whole, a lot. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, as to your question, I had never heard of the Salt River in uh, Arizona before. There's a couple other salts I've heard of. So I did some research, and I turned up some interesting data. And for anyone out there who wants to know more about a river that you're trying to fish, if you're looking at a river, I one of the best things that you can do literally is just Google the name of the river and then add fly fishing to the end of that. And you will usually turn up some fishing reports, some river overviews, river information. It can be pretty helpful. Uh, a lot of the guide websites don't have the best SEO, so they don't always show up if you just do salt river uh, you got to do Salt River fly fishing or Salt River, Arizona fly fishing uh, to, to get the results from the uh, from the fly shops and whatnot. Because a lot of fly shop websites have some good info on them. You just it takes a little digging to find it sometimes. Uh, and uh, for example, there is an Orvis report about the salt that says, uh, quote, the Salt River is located just east of the Phoenix metro area it is home to a year-round bass carp and sucker population and is stocked september through april with rainbow trout this is the closest place to town where you can catch a trout moving water early in the season october through january can be tricky fishing above fondy sutton until the salt river project starts moving water uh, out of stewart mountain dam on saguaro lake once flows begin, which fluctuate year to year, the fish spread out from their stocking locations and flies become much easier to present. This is a great river to float once water is released, opening up access to untouched parts of the river and providing an amplitude of solitude. So that's the whole thing that it says there uh, on that Orvis report. And Orvis usually has reports on a good chunk of rivers. So th that's uh, another good resource to go look at as well. Anyways, from reading that report, it sounds to me like there's very little current to use to present flies during the winter, but it's March now, so there should be some water flowing and some bugs hatching, which means you should be able to see seam lines and identify holding water a bit better. What's really telling for me, though, is that the Orvis report lists a bunch of streamers as the must-have flies for the Salt River right now. And I found a few other resources on the Salt River that all suggest fishing with streamers. So what that tells me is that you should focus on fishing those pools with streamers. You're not going to be throwing a dry dropper rig, for example, because that's just not what the fish are going to be looking for. That's not what they're going to be uh, keyed in on. They're going to want streamers at that point. Uh, especially if those riffles between the pools are shallow, there's likely no holding water in those riffles. So all the fish are going to be in the pools. And in all honesty, every time we encounter a quote-unquote weird river, which really is just something that doesn't fit our usual definition of what trout water should be, it is a great opportunity to bust out your water reading skills and improve them. Pools especially, they can be notoriously tough to read and decipher because they have so little current that you can't find seam lines and you may not be able to see rocks or places where fish might be hiding out. Uh, but I actually wrote an entire blog post uh, about fishing pools. I'll link that in the show notes as well. And just to generally summarize that post, what you want to do with a pool is fish it in a grid pattern, uh, focusing on the water closest to you and then working out to the water furthest away from you. And you want to focus on covering all of the water columns. So that means... Uh, if there are rising fish, you cast them first. If there's not, put a dry dropper rig on and get that nymph in the top third of the water column. And then after that, you put a, a double nymph rig on under an indicator and you get into that middle part of the water column or even the lower part of it. And then if that doesn't produce anything, then you go all the way down to the bottom with your nymphs or tie a streamer on to get down deep 
if the fish are all down there because in the pools with the current being so lackadaisical, the fish really will suspend just about anywhere in the water column, depending on where the food is. And the only way to really figure that out is to fish it in that very methodical grid-like pattern. So hopefully that helps you out, Dylan. And thank you again for, for writing in. I really do appreciate that. Thank you for the compliments. Uh, makes me feel, makes me feel good. And I like feeling good. And speaking of feeling good, I hope the rest of y'all are feeling good because this is the end of this week's show. But we've got something truly fantastic coming up next week. Episode 66, we are joined by Dominic Swintoski of Trout Bitten to talk all about nymphing. Yes, that's right. We're going to talk all about nymphing with Dom. He is one of the folks I respect the most. He knows his way around fly fishing with nymphs. And this is a wonderful episode. I'm excited that we get to release it. Uh, Dom was kind enough to sit down with us. And it is just a wealth of wonderful information. I think y'all are going to enjoy the heck out of that. So make sure you stick around for it. Uh, And then if you could, please make sure that you rate and subscribe to the show. When you rate the show, it bumps us up higher in the search results, makes the show more visible on Apple or Spotify or wherever, wherever you listen to us so that more people can find the VFC. The same thing happens when you leave a review. It just boosts us in the visibility. Uh, Same thing with subscriptions. It just helps more people see it and helps the show grow. And the show can't grow without your help. And I do appreciate everybody who listens to this show. Uh, Y'all are the best. We've got a wonderful, wonderful audience. And I'm lucky that I get to sit behind this microphone every week and keep doing this stuff. So please rate, subscribe, share, tell everybody about this. And you know what? It's about fishing season, so get out there on the water, get a fish on, and have a great time. And until next week, tight lines, everybody. 